Great. Well, thank you so much, and good morning to everyone. Um, I do want to thank Prairie Organic Grain for having me today. It's my pleasure. As already noted, I'm the senior correspondent for Food Navigator USA, which is a free online publication that comes out daily and covers the food and beverage industries. I'm also the host of Food Navigator USA's Soup to Nuts podcast, which airs on Fridays and covers emerging trends, marketing strategies, and regulatory pressures. And in the past few years, we have focused a lot on the growth of plant proteins. And so today I'm going to zoom through a bunch of information at a very high level. And you can see on slide two sort of a quick overview of what we're going to hit. Um, but before we really dig in, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what plant-based proteins are and how they compare to animal proteins, as this plays a pretty big part in marketing. I think it's safe to say that most people now know that plants have some protein in them. People can list quinoa and peanut butter and legumes as uh, protein-packed plants. But there is still some confusion about whether plants offer so-called complete proteins or contain all the essential amino acids that the body needs. So just to clear that up without really going to the science weeds, there are vegan complete proteins, such as pumpkin seeds and hemp seeds and chia seeds. And even when some plants are lacking an essential amino acid, chances are pretty high that people can get it from another source, which is why you'll see blending of different plant proteins and products. Now, obviously, some plants pack more of a protein punch than others, which is important if you want to make those high protein claims per serving. And I listed a few examples here, but before we take a closer look at the marketing power of those, I want to look at why we should even care. So in other words, what's the business case for all this fuss with plant protein? In the U.S., sales of plant-based proteins and beverages are undeniably up. But just how far up depends on who you're asking. So according to data from SPINS, U.S. retail sales of plant-based foods and beverages grew 3.4% to $4.9 billion in the year leading up to June 2016. More recent data from Nielsen compiled for the Plant-Based Food Association and the Good Food Institute pegged U.S. retail sales of plant-based foods and beverages up 8.1% to $3.1 billion in the year ending August 2017. So the difference between these figures comes from what each group includes in their definition and where they get their data. So for example, Nielsen does not include non-dairy creamers, and SPIN does. Likewise, Nielsen does not include data from the natural channel which is a really heavy distributor of many plant-based products and plant proteins. So with that in mind, let's take a quick look first at the Nielsen data. Because it's newer, um, Nielsen saw an increase in first-wave plant-based protein staples, such as tofu and tempeh, but a slightly higher increase in meat alternatives and milk alternatives, and then a really big jump in other dairy alternatives, so cheese and frozen dessert, dips and dressings. And I think that really shows that there's demand here and room for innovation and white space development. And so even though the SPINS data is older, it shouldn't be dismissed because, as I mentioned, it includes the natural channel where sales of plant-based foods are growing the fastest at 10.7% to about $207 million in the year ending in June 2016. This is followed by the specialty channel, which was up 7.5% to $90 million and a multi-outlet conventional channel at 3.4% to $4.6 billion. Now, obviously, plant-based is not the same as plant protein, but as these alternatives to animal products can be a pretty good stand-in for where the market's headed and can give you a, a good sense there. But to take a closer look at the specific demand for plant protein, a recent Nielsen survey um, looking at protein demands in the U.S. and Canada show that 19% of Americans and 20% of Canadians choose plant-based protein sources such as legumes, nuts, and seeds regularly. Now this is really low compared to the 78% of Americans and 82% of Canadians who said that meat is their primary source of protein, followed by eggs and dairy. But guys, there's still hope for plant proteins. So the survey's findings did suggest that there's a subtle shift occurring with 22% of Americans and 15% of Canadians saying that they plan to eat less meat, and 15% of Americans and 20% of Canadians saying they plan to eat more legumes, nuts, and seeds in the coming year. So who are all these people that are opting for plant-based proteins? 
Well, according to a survey conducted by Light Life, which makes plant-based products such as Smart Jerky and Smart Dogs, millennials are the big consumer of plant proteins. In fact, they found millennials are more likely to reduce the amount of animal protein they consume than Gen Xers or baby boomers. Another report from Packaged Facts reiterates that younger consumers under the age of 40 are more likely to reach for plant proteins. And it found just 8% of baby boomers were likely to seek out plant protein, which I thought was pretty interesting and shows that they're the least responsive group. That report also pegs the U.S. vegan population at 6%, but notes that 36% of consumers report using meat alternatives. So this shows us that plant proteins are successfully reaching to carnivores and flexitarians too. And while there's a lot of data pointing to younger consumers as a primary buyer for plant protein, I really urge you not to overlook the older shopper who is in being encouraged to use more plants um, or rather more protein, whether from plants or animals in their diet, in order to keep up their strength and maintain health. So that's a pretty good place to look for increasing business opportunity. To better understand why uh, you know, better understand who's buying plant protein. I think it's also helpful to look at why people are turning to animal alternatives. Health and wellness is obviously a major factor um, as people see them as a way to get the macronutrient, but without those high levels of cholesterol and saturated fat that are associated with animal protein. Many consumers also are turning to plant-based proteins and products as a way to manage their weight. Again, because of the lower fat, but also because of the higher amounts of satiating fiber, so they just don't have to eat as much. Um, consumers also are turning to plant-based proteins to protect the planet. According to Packaged Facts, two-thirds of Americans are interested in sustainable food options and the environmental impact of their food choices. And it found 13% of consumers consider plant-based proteins to use fewer natural resources than animal options. Another surprising factor is cost. And this really comes into play with younger shoppers. And so while it might not be as admirable, it's something to really keep in mind because packaged fats send a whopping 47% of consumers younger than 39 years somewhat or strongly agree that the lower cost of vegetarian protein is a factor in their use for it. It kind of goes without saying that animal welfare is another reason that people opt for plant proteins but also the sheer amount of plant protein options that are available now is driving increased interest. Nielsen found that the proliferation of products from plant-based proteins, especially in the meat alternative category, are really pushing people to turn away from meat. In fact, it found 14% of Americans strongly or somewhat agree that there's no need to eat animal meat in today's day and age. So as we think about protein, it's good to look at the platform, you know, how do consumers want their protein? And one of the great things about plant-based options is it's really versatile and can go across different categories and platforms. Among the categories right now with the most potential for plant protein is frozen desserts. So if you think about all those high-protein ice creams that are crowding shelves, like Halo Top, which is packed with pea protein and just flying out the grocery store door. Savory plant proteins, um, or rather savory plant-based protein snacks, also are set to grow at about a 2% compound annual growth rate, according to Euromonitor. And this could be getting a boost in part from consumers' fascination with meat snacks. So, for example, Light Life recently John, uh, launched a plant-based jerky so that vegetarians and vegans aren't left out of this crazy jerky phenomenon that we're seeing right now. Manufacturers are also raising to meet uh, demand by launching more high-protein snacks, which can be tracked in a 13% increase in protein claims from 2013 to 2014, according to data from Anova Marketing Insights. More recent data from Nielsen for the year ending in July 2017 breaks down these into its subcategories and shows a 6.2% increase in plant-based high-protein salty snacks and a 2.3% increase in cookies and crackers. Now, Anova Marketing Insight data also shows that protein claims for bakery items increased 37% in 2014. So that indicates some significant potential there. So we're going from bakery, looking at breakfast, um, cereal is another big category. Anova found cereal passed sports nutrition by almost double 
as the top market category for product launches making protein claims in 2013 to 2014. And again, Nielsen data in the back half of 2016 and the first part of 2017 show that this is an ongoing trend with a 2.7% increase in cereal and granola with high levels of plant-based protein. Building on that, there's also a lot of potential for meat substitutes in the U.S. Euromonitor values this market at about 700 million in 2016 and predicts it will continue to grow at an annual compound growth rate of 5% through 2021. Nielsen also supports the increased demand for plant-based meat alternatives, but it specifically singled out its potential in prepared food. It found sales of prepared food containing tofu, for example, grew 2% and drove $91 million in sales last year. I want to dig deeper now into some of the sources. You obviously can't get to them all, but I'm going to hit some of these big ones. Um, and the first is soy, which in many ways holds the top spot when it comes to plant proteins, as illustrated through the significant product development that's really fueling fast market growth. Data from ANOVA shows that soy, both conventional and organic, accounted for 12% of all food and beverages with protein claims launched in 2014, and 58% of all new products with vegetable-specific proteins launched in 2014. So while these figures are impressive, they're actually down 5 percentage, uh, five percentage points from the previous year, which sort of reveals the ingredient's vulnerability. Now, some of this vulnerability is due to consumer concern with GMO crops and the perception that soy in the U.S. is always genetically modified, which we know isn't true. Other consumers are turning their back on soy for fear that it's an endocrine disruptor. But perhaps the most concerning uh, worry for soy right now is that FDA recently announced that it's reconsidering the ingredient qualified health claim for heart health. So you'll recall that was just approved and would have been a huge marketing boon for soy products. Despite these negatives, there's still a lot of potential for soy, and especially organic soy. According to research from Markets and Markets, the organic soy protein is projected to reach 500.5 million by 2021, with a compound annual growth rate of 17.3% from 2016 through 21. As far as production, there was a 31% increase in acres of organic soybeans in the U.S. in 2016. So obviously some growth there, but like with all other organic ingredients, demand is really outstripping supply. So still plenty of room for growth and development. Another heavy hitter is rice. Now, even though this one might not be as trendy or as new as some of the other sources, the organic rice protein market is expected to reach $154.4 million in 2024, according to a report from Grand U Research. Much of this growth is attributed to the ongoing shift towards non-GMO options, as well as rice's status as a hypoallergenic ingredient. In addition, manufacturers like it because there's no added colors, no added sweeteners, and so that really increases its nutritional value and also its clean label attributes, which, as you know, is a huge deal right now. A closer look shows that organic rice protein isolates in particular will see compound annual growth rates of more than 18% from 2016 through 2023, according to that Grand View research report that I mentioned. It explains a significant opportunity for organic rice in sports and energy nutrition applications, and which it predicts will grow at a compound annual growth rate of more than 16% in terms of volume through 2024. Also regionally, there's a lot of potential for organic rice in North America because players are uh, really focused on increasing applications, and there's a consumer preference for these natural food ingredients. Latin America is another hot area for organic rice protein, where demand is valued at $1.5 million in 2015. And the government there is pushed to use more organic foods is also going to help boost demand in Latin America going forward. All right, so pea protein. In many ways right now, this is the darling of the industry. And we see this in the 361% increase in new product launches from 2014 compared to 2013, um, according to ANOVA. As of 2014, it also accounted for 10% of all product launches with vegetable proteins. 
zeroing in just on organic pea protein, North American sales were about $9.18 million in 2016 and are projected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of more than 12% to reach $18.4 billion, or rather million, by 2022, according to data from TechSci Research. And it projects the nutritional supplements will continue to be the largest application for organic pea protein, but snacks and bakery products also are significant. That's our meat analogs. So beverages and pea protein still is a relatively small portion, and I think that part of that is due to peas solubility. Um, it isn't as soluble as whey or soy, especially in acidic beverages with low pH, so think juices. And also, if we're honest, the flavor of pea can be a bit tricky to mask. Speaking of flavor, hemp is another really popular choice among consumers and manufacturers, um, in part because it has that nutty taste that um, is preferred by a lot of consumers to soy or flax or chia. But it also has strong nutritional credentials. It contains 25 to 35% protein, as well as a lot of fiber and a lot of omega fatty acids. While hemp has a lot going on for it, it's got really low household penetration at about 1%. Part of this could be attributed to confusion about industrial hemp versus illegal hemp products. Another challenge holding it back is the limit on where in the U.S. it can be grown. Despite these challenges, sales of hemp foods in 2015 were about $91 million, which accounts for 16% of all hemp-based products, according to the Hemp Industries Association. As for organic certification in hemp, as of 2016, NOP allowed the certification of industrial hemp, but only as long as it meets the organic standards, which is a given, but also is produced in accordance with the 2014 Farm Bill, which, as you guys know, is pretty restrictive. So hemp is kind of cool because it also holds a lot of potential for organic farming and not just finished products. The Rodell Institute is conducting a four-year research project looking at the different varieties that have been bred to produce higher yields and better quality seeds and fiber, but it's also looking at hemp as a way to suppress weeds in organic farms and to improve soil health and sequester carbon. So there's actually a lot of potential here for that. The next two slides take a closer look at duckweed and mushroom protein, which are really cool alternative proteins that are gaining traction I'm not going to go into them for um, time reasons, but there is some basic information there, and there's definitely something that everyone should keep an eye on for competitive reasons. Speaking of the competition, plant-based proteins are obviously gaining traction, but there is a lot of pressure from animals, insects, and now even science labs. So looking first at animal protein, we obviously already talked about how the Nielsen data shows that Animal meat is the primary source for protein for 78% of Americans. In addition, that market research group found that 29% of Americans consider fish and seafood a top protein source, and 19% of Americans want to add more of it to their diet. Meat producers can also be expected to fight back for market share. So, for example, the beef checkoff in the U.S. just relaunched its iconic Beef It's What's for Dinner campaign, and if you haven't seen it yet, it's packed with a lot of health information, videos on how to prepare meat to make it less intimidating, recipes. So it'll be interesting to see if that pulls folks back to animal protein. Insects are another source of protein, which is gaining ground in the U.S., not a ton, but some, and definitely shouldn't be ignored. You know, currently it's heavily reliant on cricket powder that's folded into bars and chips and other snacks but at least one company is making pasta sauce with you know, worms and crickets, and it's working on other animal replacements like nuggets and burgers. Finally, I want to call your attention to cellular agriculture, which is no longer theoretical or a futuristic concept. It's really here. So companies like Memphis Meats are making packaged products made with meat grown in the lab, and early reviews are actually really positive. One thing to watch, though, is whether or not this will appeal to vegetarians and vegans who are obviously a big base for um, plant-based protein markets. So I knew we sort of threw through all that and barely scratched the surface, but I encourage you guys to poke around Food Navigator USA for more information on plant proteins and other industry news, and I will try my best to answer any questions that you might have.
Thanks.